would open your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms. We're going to read chapter 42 and 43 as one unit, as most seem to understand them to be. If you happen to have been at the uh, Silver Saints meeting last month, you heard me deal with this psalm, these psalms, for about 20 minutes. And we have more time tonight and hope to get a little more help from them than we did then. I asked Pastor Carnes if I might read the text. Normally, scripture's read earlier in the service, but I ask that because it will help me a lot to read this passage aloud in your presence. The title, To the Chief Musician, Maskell, for the Sons of Korah. Just a word about that. Sons of Korah, Levites, uh, the choir at the tabernacle and the temple. And that unusual word, maskel, am I saying that correctly? Has to do with the particular type of song that this is. It is a song written for a purpose. And that purpose is moral instruction and mental contemplation. And I will just point out one simple lesson about this matter of worship music, and that is this, the content of a worship song ought to be suitable for both praying and preaching. That's a pretty good test. Now let's start at verse 1. As the heart, the old English form of a deer, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Judge me. O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for thou art the God of my strength. 
Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. In 1965, when I was five years old, a pastor who some say is the greatest expositor to have lived, Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, wrote a book titled Spiritual Depression. A few years later, in 1988, I read that book, and I'm going to use that as the title of this message, Spiritual Depression. Now, I want you to be sure of one thing from the get-go, and that is that I'm not going to give you a train car load of secular psychobabble. What I endeavor to do with the Lord's help is to deal with a clearly biblical subject that I think desperately needs to be understood and addressed. Spiritual depression. Now, here's the heart of what I want to convey to you tonight. And that is this one thing. That spiritual people, let me define those for you now. Spiritual people, that is born again, children of God, Christians, those who are spiritually alive in Christ. People who by the Holy Ghost of God have been regenerated, indwelt, baptized, sealed, are being witnessed to and led by the Spirit. Spiritual people do at times experience seasons of depression, which are dark and heavy, but which can be endured and or cured by the all-sufficient grace of God. Now, it's important that we understand the occasion of David's writing, Psalm 42 and 43. It is one single sad psalm, yet it's sprinkled with a message of hope, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But he was physically far removed from Jerusalem. If you study your Bible map, you'll figure out that he's about 100 miles north of his beloved city, Jerusalem. And he felt spiritually a long ways from God. Hence the emotional depth and moving in these words. The panting and the thirsting and the weeping and the remembering and the pleading of this man of God. I think that the main message before us is that of spiritual depression. And so from the text, what I hope to set before you are three clear and simple facts about the subject of spiritual depression. Number one, there is such a thing as spiritual depression. Many would debate that, but I'm standing here before you with an open Bible and declaring to you that there is such a thing as spiritual depression. What is depression? 
It is an extreme and intense and overpowering state of mind which touches all areas of life and leaves us weak and lame and crippled. The word depress means to press down. It means to sadden. It means to decrease in force. It means to make less active. It means to lessen in value. And depression can be experienced by godly people. Yes, it can. Think for a minute about the Apostle Paul's statement to the Corinthians about his being pressed out of measure. And that is to say that he was weighed down and burdened. Think of Simon Peter's statement about the fact that believers at times would experience heaviness, and that is to be distressed and to be grieved. Think of John's confession of his going through with the people of God a great season of tribulation, and that is to feel afflicted and to be in a miserable state. And here is David, a man after God's own heart, and in verse 5 and verse 11 in Psalm 42, and in verse number 5 of Psalm 43, and then one of the phrases he uses another time in verse 6, in Psalm 42, David, a godly man, uses two terms that helps us explain the matter of spiritual depression. One is cast down and the other is disquieted. We might more commonly speak of being downcast rather than cast down. That means to be in despair. And the root word of cast down means to sink or to depress or to be bowed down under a great weight, cast down. To be disquieted actually means to be disturbed. And the root of that means to make a loud sound, literally to be in great commotion to be troubled, to be in an uproar. And take note now, this is how David, a man after God's own heart, is describing his experience. He's describing the condition of his own soul. We would say he's describing his own state of mind, his own present inner man and heart condition. I believe that if you study the Word of God, you'll have to agree concerning spiritual depression. There is such a thing. Let me ask you something. Do we believe this to be the truth? Do we see it in the Word of God and agree with it? Do we know it for ourselves? Well, guess what? Quite often, you wouldn't know it by looking at us or by listening to us. You know why? Because we try to hide it. We put on our Sunday go to meeting uniform, and we put on our Sunday go to meeting mask, and we try to hide it with our looks. And then we get to church, and of all places, we tell more lies there than any other place in the world. What do we say to one another? Well, good morning. How are you doing? And how do we answer? Pardon? Fine, thank you. How are you? But quite often, just like David, the truth of the matter is, on the inner man, if we were honest about the state of our soul, we would say, the truth of the matter is, I'm cast down and I am disquieted. Externally, 
We look okay, but internally, we are not. Externally, we always want to appear as though we've got it all together, but internally, we are oftentimes all to pieces. There is such a thing as spiritual depression. Here's the second fact I want to state. And that is that there are many contributing factors to spiritual depression. Many. Now, I'm going to share with you seven things that I believe are contributing factors to spiritual depression. And these seven things, if you jot them down and then go back and study the life of David, you can easily find them. Or if we had the time and we were digging out these things from the text of Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, we could easily identify them there. But I'll let you do that on your own. I'm just going to quickly give you the list and move on. Things that contribute to spiritual depression. One is the situation. As much as I do not like to hear sermons about the situation. The fact of the matter is the situation that we find ourselves living in is often a cause of spiritual depression. Living in this world, living in this filthy, fallen, foolish world is enough to make a godly man groan. And the truth of the matter is that's normal. Read Romans 8, and you'll find it stated very plainly. And I know that our heart's desire is the sweet by and by. Amen? But until then, it's the dirty here and now. And it's enough to grieve the heart of a godly man. And of course, sin is a contributing factor to spiritual depression. Not only the evil that's around us, but the evil that's within us. The Puritan Ezekiel Hopkins made this statement. He said, the guilt of sin lying upon the conscience will exceedingly deaden a heart for prayer. Now, I don't think he would mind if I expanded that just a little bit. To say that the guilt of sin lying upon the conscience will exceedingly deaden a heart for praise and leave us in a state of spiritual depression. Number three on the list is stress. And here's what I'm learning. Stress is often caused by change. Don't you hate that? Change, and the older I get, the less I like change, but the older I get, the more I have to deal with change. I happen to have a good friend at work. His name is Robbie. Some of you know him. He's a young man. He's in his 40s, and he gave me permission to tell his story. The other day, he was in my office talking to me, and he shared some of this with me in the past, and this time it was a very different uh, spirit about him when he shared it. Three years ago, his wife, Angie, that he loves dearly, and they have no children, it's just them two together. Three years ago, his young wife, Angie, in her 40s, had a serious, debilitating stroke. And she's been through a lot of uh, therapy and a lot of treatment. And she has not recovered from that stroke. And evidently, she may not ever recover from that stroke. Evidently, that stroke changed her forever. And at the same time, it changed the life of her husband, Robbie, forever. And as he stood there and talked to me about the stress that he felt by this unwelcome change in his life, he just broke down and began to weep. And he said, man, I didn't mean to cry on you. I'm sorry. And I said, I said, it's all right. It's okay. You go ahead. 
and you cry. Here's another contributing factor, and that's sickness, physical sickness. Not the sickness of another person, but our own sickness. Now, there are a few rare ones out there, and here's what I mean. There are a few rare folks who are able to maintain a cheery heart in a sick body, but I am not one of them. I'm wired differently. Um, when I'm down physically, I'm down emotionally, and I'm down spiritually, I cannot seem to separate one from the other. And sometimes sickness, especially if it doesn't just come to visit, but it comes to stay for a long time, can lead us to a point of spiritual depression. And we cannot fail to mention Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ said that Satan, the devil, is a thief and he has come with a specific purpose. And that purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now here's some good news. If you are a born again child of God, you are kept by his power for all of time and all of eternity, which means Satan cannot steal your soul. Well, let's just stop and have a praise meeting. Amen? Isn't that good news? But the bad news is this. The bad news is he at times robs us of our joy. He is a sly, subtle, sneaky pickpocket. I think he's better at it than the artful dodger in Oliver Twist. He will come along and just, before you know it, whisper some defaming lies in our minds about the character of our God, and before we know it, We've lost our joy, and we're in a state of spiritual, weighted down, burdened depression. And then, here's one other thing that's occurred to me, and that is, a certain sinner can contribute to spiritual depression. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to call any names. Every, okay? Everybody keep your seats. I'm not going to... But somebody might cross your mind. Okay? Now, the truth is we're surrounded by sinners. They tell us there are how many? Seven billion sinners in this world? But every now and then... You cross paths with one sinner who thinks that his mission in life is to make you miserable. This, this, this child of the devil who, who seeks to do you harm because you are a child of God. And one other I'll mention is sadness. Sad things happen every day. But sometimes there are certain types of sad things that happen that are so great they can flood our souls into the depths of depression. On January the 14th, I went and got the newspaper, it was a Saturday, and I read this, and I stood in disbelief, silently staring at the newspaper, laying on the dinner table, with tears slowly rolling down my cheeks, and spattering onto the pages. This is Cassandra Nicole Cassie Harmon. 
Miss Cassandra Nicole Cassie Harmon, 18, Lower Hopedale Road, died January the 12th, 2012. Probably most of you don't know her. Many years ago, we were foster parents in Alamance County. And our aim and our wish and our goal was to foster to adopt. And for several months, we kept four-year-old Cassie Harmon in our home. And then she was just a little stick of a girl. But I can still remember how tight she could hug you and hang on to you when you carried her places. You know, nothing saddens the heart like the death of someone that you love. And if we're not careful, sadness in this category can roll over our souls like a flood and leave us in the depths of despair, spiritual depression. Well, the question now is what to do. Thank the Lord there is a remedy for spiritual depression. Now, first, I want you to understand something. I'm not going to be so shallow and so foolish, and I'll just say it. I'm not going to be so stupid as to stand here before you and say, Take notes now. Here are five easy steps to your deliverance. No. No. But I will tell you, and I will counsel you, and I will encourage you, and I will urge you to do exactly what David did in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. If we wanted to, we could point out a number of things, but I want to focus on the one thing that he seemed to focus on most, which evidently is the essential element to the remedy for spiritual depression. So exactly what did David do? What did he do? Well, he fastened his mind upon the character of his God. Just notice it. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me, hope Thou in God. And there, in verse number 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. And in Psalm 43 and verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. God. What did David do? Well, he began to talk to himself about God. And when we find ourselves spiritually depressed, one of the best things that we can do is look into the mirror and commence to preaching. Look in the mirror and commence to preaching to the man or woman looking back at us about the character of our God. He told himself, he told his spiritually cast down and disquieted soul to hope in God. To hope in is to wait upon, to be patient for, to stay with, to tarry before, to trust in. David is talking to himself, and he's telling himself to stop and to be still and to submit himself unto his God. Now, if you read through and you count as I did, and then use a concordance to make sure you didn't miss one. Twenty-one times he uses 
God, G-O-D. And uh, that is the Hebrew Elohim, used in the scripture to refer to the supreme God, found first time in the first verse of the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, Elohim, God created the heavens and the earth. And it speaks to us of God's great power as creator. One time, David uses the term Lord, L-O-R-D. And that is the Hebrew name of God, Jehovah. And that refers to the self-existence and eternality of the God of Israel. And it speaks of the faithfulness of God as the covenant keeper. And so David here is preaching to himself. And he's saying, cast down and disquieted soul. Remember the character of your God. Remember his power. Remember he is the creator. Remember his faithfulness. He is the covenant keeper. That's what he had to say to himself. And so what I would say to you is this. And what I have to say to myself oftentimes is, Thad Boyd, stop and think. Stop and think. The one and only living eternal deity is your God. The uncreated and unchangeable, the omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent one. That's big words, isn't it? That means the all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present God is your God. He's yours. Listen, if you are in Christ and the Holy Ghost is in you, he is your God for time and for eternity. And that one fact I have found to be, when all else crumbles and fails and fades away, I have found to be the knot at the end of my rope, that this God is my God for time and for eternity. His loving kindness is eternally set upon me. And this God, my God, is too powerful to fail. He's too good to do wrong. And he's too wise to make one single mistake. And everything that he's doing will ultimately prove to be for the blessing of my soul. This is my God. And this is the remedy for spiritual depression. Now, let me finish by asking you first a question, then stating to you a reminder, and then making to you a promise. And it's not my promise, but it's God's promise. First a question, and that is, are you in a state of spiritual depression? If that's the case, be humbled by it, but do not lose heart. It's a common malady. The people of God often go through these types of valleys. Be humbled by it, but do not lose heart. But second now, a reminder, and that is you are not alone. And you're thinking, well, praise God because misery loves company. That's not what I mean at all. You know, when you ask the question like David asked, God, why is it that you have forgotten me? You need to remember the words of the one who has said, 
I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Listen to me. David was about a hundred miles away from Jerusalem. And he was remembering the blessed seasons of participating in public worship and the joy that it was to his soul. And now he is far away, exiled, probably literally running for his life, way up there at the starting point of the Jordan River and seeing the springs gush and seeing through the mountains the waterfalls crash and saying, oh my God, my sorrows are rolling over my soul just like these waters. But I want you to understand something. David might have been a hundred miles away from Jerusalem, but he was not a hundred miles away from Jehovah. He was in the immediate presence of God right then and right there. We need to remember something. Whether you feel him or not, he has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Whether you feel like waving your hanky and shouting amen or not, he has promised he will never leave you nor forsake you. Whether you're weeping and your heart is heavy and you can hardly bear to look others in the eye and speak to them, he promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you feel him or not, he's here. And if you feel him or not, the Holy Ghost has taken up residence within you and will be with you forever. That is so important to remember. When you question, God, why have you forgotten me? He has not forgotten you. He has not, and he never will. Another thing to remember is this. <clears throat> when the ungodly question you, notice the number of times when David referred to those oppressive, persistent, blaspheming mockers who said to him, All right, David, well, where's your God now? Okay, David. Okay, Mr. Spiritual. Where's God now? Well, here's the answer. The same place he's always been. That's where he is. He is on his sovereign, eternal, and glorious throne that's where he's always been. That's where he is right now. And you, my friend, you, my mocking friend, you, my blaspheming friend, will learn about it sooner or later, one way or another. That's good to remember. And finally, a promise. And that is this. One day before long, and it will not be as long as it has been. One day before long, one way or another, you, that is my dear brother or sister in Christ who, who knows what it means to go through seasons of spiritual depression, you shall be delivered. His nail-scarred hand will wipe all of your tears away. All of them in the land of cloudless day. I want to read to you part of a hymn. I read it this morning in Sunday school. And it's titled, The Unclouded Day. And uh, if I were able, I would sing it. So you know what that means. I'll read it. The author is Josiah K. Allwood. He died in 1909. And these are the words of three out of four 
stanzas. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. I was going to skip that one, but I can't now. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a king in his beauty there, and they tell me that mine eyes shall behold where he sits on the throne that is whiter than snow in the city that is made of gold. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows all the way. And they tell me that no tears will ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day. Spiritual depression is something that is experienced at times by the people of God. It can be very dark and it can be very heavy. But it can be endured and or, or cured by the all-sufficient grace of God in this life. And you can rest assured that it will be eradicated in the life to come. Let's bow and pray, and then we'll ask Brother Greg Phillips to come with our last hymn. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. We thank you for the word of God. and We ask, we pray, we hope that you would see fit to minister to our hearts. Lord, I pray for any precious child of God here this evening whose mind is troubled, who's weighted down, who's burdened in such an excessive intense manner that it could rightly be called spiritual depression Lord I pray that you would come along and turn their minds and hearts afresh to the character of our God to your your great power the creator of all things and Lord, to your absolute faithfulness, you are the covenant keeper. And Lord, we pray that if there's any soul here in this building, young ones or old ones, who are outside of Christ, dead in sin, lost and undone, Lord, might they stop and realize their need of Jesus Christ. Might they not mock us poor Christians who get wearied and worried along the route to heaven? Might they, by your grace, begin to worry about their own sin and their own soul? And by your grace, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. And that's the worthy name that we pray in. Amen.